be doing a deep exploration on the concept of hypergamy. And if you don't know what that is, I'll explain in a second. And what I'm going to explain in this video is it is not a woman to man issue. It is a human to human issue, as in men to men, woman to woman, woman to man, man to woman, person to person. Hypergamy is universal. I'm not sure if the strict definition could include uh, man to man or whatever, but the same driver of hypergamy is absolutely universal. And then what I'm gonna to explain to you is that hypergamy is a lot fucking crazier than you think it is. It is insane what it does. It is so much worse than you would even imagine on the most vitriolic over the top podcast. I mean, they are barely scratching the surface of how incredibly fucked up this is. Um, and then what I'm gonna to explain in this video is how the Bible, and particularly the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus is actually in many ways driven to finding forgiveness for this component of human nature. <laughs> Jesus says, forgive them for their hypergamy. Okay, but in other words, um, forgiving people for that deep part of our human nature that is really, really, really fucked up. And in understanding this, what I hope that you begin to understand is social interaction at a much, much, much higher level. I hope that you're able to see what social interaction really is and what the drivers are of things like social status, attraction, even friendship. What are the drivers of that? Um, but I hope that you're also able to understand your own rationalizations at a much deeper level and also how to lead relationships in a way that is not causing the hypergamy to cause that relationship to implode. And I've certainly made that mistake myself. So I will cop to errors that I've made in this video. And my main purpose for doing this, and this is not meant to be like a sticky, icky, happy video, but it's created with genuine intention is to help bring people together because at the end of the day, um, you know, we're seeing everything from modern day feminism to a lot of the men's rights stuff. And, you know, I support people in getting out their opinions and in, um, you know, pushing for an agenda that they care about. And so anybody who's trying to get those ideas out, I understand that they're trying to do good. But I believe that at some point we, we kind of have, we have to create sort of a synthesis and people have to come back together if we don't get a handle on this, the nuclear family is going to be destroyed. Society is going to be ripped to shreds. It's already getting to that point. And so once we've sort of identified what the tendencies are, I believe that we need to drive the conversation into resolution in some ways. Otherwise, it's almost like you're dating somebody and they're mad and they're mad and they're mad, but they never want to find a solution. You're like, baby, let's be solution oriented, right? We can't just sit here arguing and arguing and arguing for people to get clicks. Uh, we've got to be solution oriented at some point. Now, I've got a lot of friends who actually promote this stuff and I agree with a lot of things they say, and I think it's incredibly valuable what they're teaching and opening people's eyes, but I would even suggest to them, and I'm gonna to talk to them about this in person, that we have to drive this towards some kind of a resolution, and you don't think about what that would look like. So that's what we're gonna go into here is the deep, deep, deep understanding of human nature, the painful parts, the scary parts, the insane parts. Does everybody cheat? Yes, yes, but is there a good girl out there? <laughs> okay, a good guy? <laughs> But there is this human nature and there's our ability to deal with human nature, okay? Now, if you like this kind of thing and you wanna to learn to master it and to master the game, what I'd recommend that you do is go much, much deeper down the rabbit hole, www.blueprintreloaded.com. And this is a program which I spent half a decade working on. It's a, it's a seminar that I did for about five years and it's a seminar that would cost about $5,000 to attend combined with an online mentoring that was around 3,700 for the base package, you know, maybe 8K, some cases 25K. I'd hop right in here. So if you want to benefit from the best work that I've done in five years, first major program I did, Blueprint Decoded, which was 2008, second was Hot Seat at Home, 2016. This is the third one, Blueprint Reloaded, 2024. The years and iteration in this, if you wanna get incredible OG social skills, amazing ability to make money, amazing ability for public speaking, trauma healing, being happy, deciding life of your dreams, motivation, and all the different things that you see me doing, and you'd like to see that within the context of around an 80-hour program that has community support, access to me personally, mentoring with me personally, mentoring with the team every single day, at least as of putting this out, that'll eventually cool off. So if you wanna get in there, get in there now, hop into www.blueprintreloaded. And what this is gonna be, in my view, is the most impactful training you ever do. If you do not get at least double the results that you have now, fucking refund it, honestly. But really what I'm looking for is 10 
excellent results in watching this program. Get inside Blueprint Reloaded right now and let's get into it. Okay, so blah, a foray into hypergamy. It's worse than you think it is in every way possible. Okay, I've been out in nightclubs for 20 years. The things that I have seen are beyond your imagination. And what began to scare me most about the things that I would see is not just how rampant massive amounts of cheating is. I mean, it is fucking insane how much cheating is going on. Um, but the thing that really scared me was the inability of the people that were doing it to even be aware that they're cheating. So in other words, um, once hypergamy is triggered and the person cheats, typically they will be pathological liars about it and it will actually wipe itself out of the person's brain of what they did. And I have been the person that other people cheated with many times. And I can tell you, I can't even begin to explain how many times somebody who I met is sitting in my bed and they're calling their significant other and I didn't even know they had a significant other and just the pathology with which they lie and cover it up and the way they justify it, this will happen night after night after night after night. And I mean, it gets to the point where this could even be happening with the person right there. It's beyond your imagination and um, you kind of get to the point where you stop even being mad about it. You just say to yourself, you know what, I gotta really like kind of man up here and just be somebody who's uh, basically the higher value person in any interaction so that I'm not gonna be exposed to this. And that's pretty much what it comes down to. And what you'll understand when you go out is, <clears throat> for example, I'm five foot nine. And I could be with a guy who's six foot four, classically good looking, way more money than me, but whoever is the, domi the more dominant, funnier person in that interaction who is kind of controlling the frame the best and controlling the energy the best and has the most stimulus, that is the person that's gonna be getting all of the attention in that social interaction. And it's really like this magnet, right? And when you understand how to operate that magnet, which again, we cover that in, in psycho depth inside Blueprint Reloaded, but when you understand how to run that magnet properly, and you pass all the congruence tests, and you're controlling the frame well, and your subcommunication is on point, body language, eye contact, vocal tone, vocal intonation, uh, your ability to free associate, your ability to control those frames. When that's all clicking really, really well, you will hold attention like it's a tractor beam. And a lot of the concepts in the community about what, what they would call a high value man, um, it's sort of weird what's happened there. It, it's gone in a very, very strange direction because I feel like what happens a lot of the podcasts, and again, I like these podcasts. I wish them all the best, a lot of them are my friends. But what I think happens is they want to relate intergender dynamics to women. And so a lot of these sort of obscure concepts like frame control or vocal intonation or things like this, you know, control, you know, control of energy and whatnot are so abstract for a woman to hear about that they sort of shift the conversation into, uh, you know, they'll call it six figures, six feet, six packs, six inches, whatever. <laughs> and they, I think they do that because that's at least relatable to a woman. And so you can kind of have like a little bit of debate and a little bit of dialogue. But in fact, all of those things are really sort of like a mainstream way of just saying whoever has better frame control. So commonly what happens, and I think this is valuable to understand, is that the average person who is not, you know, six feet, six figure, six pack, whatever, whatever, they will in most cases never learn proper frame control because they'll never give themselves permission to do so. Um, this is, there, there's sometimes these uh, television shows, for example, where you have this, uh, these kind of like nerdy guys who are, who are trying to like, you know, get the girl in the, in the show. It's like a reality show, right? And then they're like, what will matter more, personality and real love or a big jerk, good looking guy? And so like, you know, the nerds will kind of like, you know, try to befriend the girl and then the big jerk, good looking guy eventually comes in and they ditch the nerd and they go with the better looking guy. And so the conclusion is the looks are more important than the personality because the nerd had the better personality. But that's not really true because the better looking guy actually gives himself permission to have a better personality. The actual better personality, vocal tone, body language, eye contact, frame control, energetic control, and so on and so forth, you know, being, uh, you know, being that person who really expresses themselves and is non-approval seeking, that guy that just doesn't give a fuck and is, own man, and is his own man, the guy that's 6'2 and looks like the person that should act like that will act like that. Does that make sense, right? So in other words, let me put it to you this way. If you transported my brain into the body of somebody who's in a wheelchair, and I wasn't personally devastated 
by losing my mobility and dealing with the trauma of that, and it was just something I did for an hour, I could run around a nightclub and I could get all the same incredible social results as somebody who's six foot two, even in a wheelchair. I could, if it wasn't for all this weird drama around the stuff, I would go in a wheelchair right now, I'd make videos of it, I'd post it, it'd be awesome, it'd be crazy, it really doesn't matter, okay? And you, you could come on a training with me, you could ask me to do it, I'll show you how, it's honestly a joke. But that would be because, despite being, you know, for that temporary hour and not having to, like, again, deal with the real trauma of actually losing mobility, which is really traumatizing, but if I was just doing it as like a fun thing, um, or just doing it as a prank, frankly, um, because I understand control of frames and I, I basically understand how to have the higher value, so I would give myself permission to not only act like a guy who's a six foot two good looking millionaire, I'd give myself permission to act 100x at that guy's level. I would be using my voice 100 times better than him. I'd be controlling frames better than him, self amused better than him, funnier than him. Every single thing will be dialed in and on point at a level where those guys can't compete. You gotta understand that when you know this stuff, you are a wrecking ball, okay? You are a wrecking ball at any venue that you go to, to where everywhere that you go, even couples that are very happy, oftentimes, uh, you know, you're snagging one of them off and you're not even doing it on purpose and you're like, what happened? Like, this is insanity. That is because you've dialed in all these different things, right? But in order to do that, you have to come out of the societal trance that tells you, unless you look like that guy, you're not allowed to be that guy. So basically the best way that I could put it to you, and, and girls talk about this sometimes, they're like, they're, they're like, what do you like to date better? You know, the good looking guy, and like, he's, he's kind of like a, you know, kind of like a bit of a dick and he's cocky, or would you rather date like, you know, like, like the kind of ugly guy, but he's like kind of funny and he's nicer and he appreciates you more. And often in those conversations, they'll be like, and then there's that ugly guy that thinks he's the good looking guy. And you're dating him, you're like, what the fuck? How do you even act like this? Basically, you wanna be that guy, <laughs> okay? <Yeah. laughs> it's like, you, you, almost, you, almost, you wanna be at the point where you're even, you're 50 to 100X more confident with yourself than if you're Leo DiCaprio. Like, whatever amount of confidence Leo has, 100X it. That is what I would tell you. How do you do it? Just decide to. Is it really that hard? You really can't do it, you really can't figure it out. I think you can, for example, if you've ever jerked off, ooh, fapping, no fap, right? If you ever jerked off, you use your hand to have erotic gay self sex with yourself until you came, <laughs> okay? You, you went like that and hypnotized yourself until you ejaculated in your own male hand using your imagination. Do the same thing with knowing that you're the shit. Just loop that in your mind over and over and over, I'm the fucking man, I'm the fucking shit, I'm a fucking 10. Really, don't view yourself even as a zero to 10. View yourself as transcendent of the entire dynamic. Zero to 10 is for the plebs. That's like some pleb shit, okay? That's like the unthinking masses. You're at infinity level. You're not even categorized. Then you're your own category, you're one of one. I, I've made videos about the one of one concept. I'll probably make another one. Maybe I'll make another one this week, okay? You're one of one. You're not even in comparison with anybody else. You're totally in your own frame. You, here's the key to everything. If you wanna get the, the keys to the kingdom in a couple sentences, you do not, keys to the universe in a couple sentences, if you could listen, but you probably won't. But if you could, I'll give you the keys to the universe. You do not feed into any frame in which you are not a 10. You do not acknowledge any frame in which you are not a 10. And you're very, very good at mocking, clowning, and playfully in a very funny, light, non-insecure way, playfully condescending any frame that you're not a 10. So in other words, you know, if you're, if you're talking to someone who's really beautiful, you like kind of come in and you like do a little pose, and you're like, ah, ah, you know, like, like things like that. Maybe, maybe you grab your phone and you, you, you do like a, a Instagram story where you're like, hey, like the way that they do. Basically, you're just really, really good at imitating all, the, all these like over the top silly things that they do, but you're not doing it for a result, you're doing it because you genuinely think it's hilarious and it genuinely cracks you up. So it's done without agenda. As soon as it has an agenda, it doesn't, ceases to work, makes you look try hard, insecure, lame, whack, beta male, loser. But if you're doing it because you actually, actually enjoy it, so you're, you're able, so like, like my favorite way to open is always imitation. Imitation is often the drive of like 
half an interaction of what I do is just like imitating. And the people I'm talking to are on the floor laughing, they're pissing themselves, they're convulsed, they're like, stop, right? Like anything with imitation. And then what you do is you so firmly believe in your frame that it's like your style of interaction is the shit. Your opinions are the shit. Your friends are the shit. You're basically Donald Trump, <laughs> right? You're like, it's huge, it's amazing, it's spectacular. I remember reading about Donald Trump's, uh, like the hamburgers of the Trump Tower. He's like, this hamburger is spectacular, it's amazing, it's incredible, it's fantastic, it's enormous, right? Like, but you don't necessarily speak like that because I find I personally find that to be self-qualifying and I think in interactions it's also a little bit transparent. But it's done it's done via show don't tell. And what I mean by show don't tell is it's done in vocal cadence, um, total absolute confidence. But see, the confidence is not like a frothing up a confidence. It's more like a lack of unconfidence. So in other words, it, it's just like this clean presence, not of um, belief but of a knowing, not just what you believe about yourself, what you know about yourself. You are infinite, you are infinity. You're not a 10, you're infinity. You're one of one. Forge in the image of your creator. You are one of one, unique and special. And you have that love in yourself and you found that love within yourself and by moving the energy through your own body, not trying to take in validation from the external, you're just beaming with energy, the cup runneth over, people sense that from you, you are now beyond a 10, um, people resonate with you, you are a wrecking ball where you go because you are the sun and people just gravitate to you and it's just a done deal, okay? So from that standpoint, when you know this, we'll bring it back to hypergamy, when you, because we could talk about this all day, maybe it should, it should be my next video, but, um, with it, now I just kind of want to talk about this, but anyway, while you're basically uh, thinking about that within the context of hypergamy, you're going to see crazy shit. I mean, the things that you're going to see are going to blow your mind. And what you're basically going to see is rampant cheating, and everybody's going to tell you, it's just LA, right? Let's ignore the fact that I spent about 280 days a year in Montana, Wyoming, Arizona, New Mexico, Oregon, Washington State, um, Alabama, like, Yes, I live in LA, I'm here like two months a year, and I spend time in Alabama. But let's pretend that, you know, that I didn't spend time in Alabama. Let's pretend that I only live in Hollywood with all these like value whores, or like what people would say. But of course, in reality, this works even a thousand times better outside of LA. Because in effect, here I'm an okay fish in a huge pond, there you're a, you're a big fish in a small pond. This stuff works thousands of times better. I mean, in small towns, in th this, th the problem is, the problem, I guess you'd call it, the, the phenomenon is massively accentuated. So clearly, you know, hypergamy and the cheating and stuff is psycho, it's everywhere. But see, the, the rampant cheating and the epiphany that, you know, without the maintenance of frame, it, it's, the horse is out of the fucking barn. That is the least of what it is that you're, not understanding of how crazy this is. But again, I'm gonna show this is both guys and girls. It's not a woman thing. Um, it's a human thing. It's not just that. The, crazy, the craziest part of hypergamy, in my view, is both the pathology of the person rationalizing it, but it's also that when they choose to leave, if you fuck up and you lose frame, it is very, and basically fell into lead, what you will see is that the person often, the person who you're with in effect dies. That person, the person that you knew dies. And an entirely new person is born. Like, like you are, it, it's almost like you are triggering, like by being low value and by failing to lead, it's very much like you're causing the person that you were with, your, your, your intimate partner, the person that you love the most in the entire world, you're triggering, obviously their, their body lives, like their body continues to live, their, their brain is still there, but the core spiritual essence of who they were, the lights go out, and that's why you've probably seen this, that when you lose frame, they have something called an RAS flip. And an RAS flip is basically, here's pretty much how it works. So if you know, if you know what RAS is, um, what RAS is is selective focus. So there's, there's all these different examples of RES, but the, but the basic gist of it, you know, the, the one Tony Robbins will give is he'll say, you know, look around for things that are brown, look around for things that are brown, look around for things that are brown. So you look around for things that are brown. He says, now close your eyes. So let's say that you do that. Look around for things that are brown, close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. Like, actually, I'd recommend that you actually do it if you want to see the exercise, close your eyes. Okay, tell me everything's green. 
Oh, you could remember because you're looking for everything that's brown. So your RAS is focused on that which is brown, right? So you're going to find examples of that. An RAS flip occurs when, let's say this is the full context of your relationship with somebody, okay? And let's say that 97 things out of 100 that you did, you love that person, you gave your soul to them, you do anything for them, like you literally would die for them. Like that's where this gets crazy, is someone that you would die for has an RAS flip. Like I would have died for you. Actually, like I, I would, if I saw a car about to hit you, like I would for sure jump in front of that then watch you die. I couldn't live with myself. I'd be so traumatized, I'd rather just be dead. I would die for you. I would give an organ to you. And, and you just watch them flip to the point that they don't even know who you are anymore. And what happens is that if there's three things that you did that were bad, maybe even very bad, but there's 97 that were amazing, the shift when you lose value or lose frame goes on to the three that are bad. And then they loop on that, loop, 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 and that becomes who you are. And so the total of your identity dies of who you are as a person. You become those three bad things. That gets rationalized. And then there's often a monkey branch to the next partner. Um, people will say all day, they're going to say, oh, that's like an LA thing. They're going to say things like, um, you know, my partner wouldn't do that, and so on and so forth. Um, I would really, really advise you uh, to shift away from that kind of thinking. Um, that kind of thinking is very, very, very dangerous. And I would instead guide you to the following thought process. If you don't like hypergamy, you might as well be saying that you don't like women. If you don't like, if you don't love hypergamy, it means that you don't love women. If you don't love the flaws of human nature, it means that you don't love men. In other words, a major, major biblical teaching is centered on forgiveness. Okay, read the Sermon on the Mount. Please read it, okay? Go look up uh, David Suchet, Sermon on the Mount. The answer to hypergamy is not to be mad about it, hypergamy, however you pronounce it. It's not to be mad about it. It's not to shame people for it. You're not gonna shame it out of people. You're not going to fight 100 million years of evolution and win, you're just not. It's not to resist this. It's not to say that I'm from LA even though I'm probably more in small towns than you. It's, it, 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 none of that is the answer, okay? The answer is forgiveness and the answer is learning how to lead, okay? And then people will say, well, I don't wanna be with someone if I have to maintain frame all the time, it's exhausting then that's kind of a sign that you're not worthy to reproduce because it's really not that hard to lead. But like, I feel like where I have fucked up, and there's many areas I've fucked up, but where I have fucked up was in the belief that I had that what would make a good partner is they don't have hypergamy. You know, right? Like I'd, like I'd meet someone who I felt like was less in that department and I somehow felt that that made them better but then in the end, it still existed because that's hundreds of millions of years of evolution. And then I, basically what I'm doing is I'm taking a, another human being who has hundreds of millions of years of evolutionary wiring and then I'm shaming them for that and I'm holding that against them and, and viewing that as a knock on them rather than understanding that that is the body in which their soul is housed and adapting to it and then realizing I need to lead. So that was sort of like you know a process of forgiveness that, I'd have to, that I've had to go through and again, how do, we, how do we get around? Look at all the misbeliefs on this. Misbelief number one, it's just women who do it. Men don't have their own version of it, which I'll get to later, including on other men, especially surrounding money. Oh, it's all women. Female nature, they'll call that, even though it's human nature. Female nature just means human nature. Um, just the, the applications and manifestations of it are different. The faces are different. The underlying root instinct is the exact same, I promise you. In fact, I've found the, the biggest people that hurt me were men, not women, certainly. Um, like, knife in my heart was done by men. Women sad what can happen but is what it is men it's like it's like stabbing you in the heart while you die i mean it's fucking crazy so um number one putting that as female nature again that's called human nature um number two understanding hypergamy is like this woman thing when it's basically hypergamy is basically just res flips that happen due to shifts in buyer seller dynamic shifts in value and status dynamics and it creates an res flip and then basically cause the person to often create a new uh identity in order to sever themselves from going backwards okay so that's the next misbelief. And then the next misbelief is that somehow being a leader is a bad thing and that, and that basically that um, women should just be your mother and somehow they should give you the same unconditional love that your mother gave. And you see, and again, you see a lot of bitterness towards this. Why don't you realize that if you're a man who's a five, you can date a 10 and you can literally do that just by leading. 
Why does that piss you off? If this did not exist, that would mean that a five gets a five. Um, oh, by the way, it's actually, it's actually even crazier than this. Basically, it would mean that if you're a five, you're stuck at a five. If you're a six, you're stuck at a six. If you're a seven, you're stuck at a seven. When you as a five can become a 10 and get everybody. And then from everybody, pick someone that you love to death and want to spend your life with or have a family with. So the dynamic is in your favor. It's built to help you, but you're pissed. I think the reason that you're pissed is just that your expectations are skewed. It's not that you're mad. It's that, it's that your expectations are skewed, but also that, again, you're putting this just towards women. This, and this isn't me being like liberal or leftist or anything like that. Okay, I'm somebody who is very much the opposite of that. This is me trying to explain to you that if, if you also don't think that men have this, you're going to get floored harder by men than by girls. I mean, you're going to wind up with, I mean, I don't know. I would say like out of all the money that I've produced in my life, I would say huge amounts of that money um, has been embezzled out of businesses that I've run via everything from people shirking on work, embezzling from the company, stealing leads, um, stealing business concepts. I mean, you're looking at tens of millions of dollars in my life force and energy that it took to generate that has been leaked out of my ecosystem by men who did the exact same thing um, as, the, as women would do for the exact same reasons, shifts in buyer-seller dynamic, shifts in status and status dynamics, and then, and then having an RES flip and then creating a new identity to, to justify moving on from it. That same phenomenon happens with men and with, with, with women. Of course it does. It's just called human beings DNA, rationalizing being selfish, and the fact that most humans are mechanistic and on autopilot and they need Jesus. <laughs> I mean, it's, I couldn't even, I'm saying it as a joke, but I'm really not joking. So, um, or they need some kind of spirituality of, of whatever you know is culturally relevant to them. I, I just happen to have my own opinion. So from that basic standpoint in understanding this, in my view, we shift our understanding of hypergamy and, and we and, and realize that this is fucking crazy. We have to shift it and and shift it from this is this thing that girls do to guys. And we shift it to a ba our base level DNA is sociopathic, pretty much psychotically selfish. Our DNA gets control of the wheel. And so it kind of works like this. If I were to invite you to a seminar, okay, and you value what it is that I'm teaching, and you see me as a leader, you will be on your best behavior in that seminar. Now, back at home with your friends, you might be a whiny little bitch. You might complain, you might steal, you might be annoying, you might be messy. But if you value my leadership and I invite you to a seminar, say here, here up here in the mansion, the behavior is incredible. I mean, I can run about a 200 person event up here. I actually run seminars up here. You might've seen them. Like I actually run them up at the crib. Sometimes small private trainings, sometimes uh, huge seminars. Isn't it amazing that like all 200 people are on phenomenal behavior? I ran a party here last weekend, hundreds of people over. Amazing behavior. Everyone treats me so well. Wow, look how good everyone treats me. Am I fucking dumb enough to believe for a minute that all 200 people that I invite up to my party or past seminars are all just these low drama people who never annoy their roommates and never annoy their friends and never stole anything and they're all just great? No, the dynamics were established where I was a leader and they cared about my approval. They wanted to be at my party. They viewed me as higher status and so they were led and they were led to the promised land of their best behavior. And, and what's the outcome of that? The outcome of that is that at a seminar, People are quiet while listening, actively participate in exercises, and produce rapid transformations. At a party, the result is people are having fun, they're socializing, they're pumping a good vibe, and people there who I might want to date or have social interactions with or make friends with or network with or whatever are really open and receptive to it. Positive outcomes. Synergistic outcomes, positive outcome, outcomes where people can benefit from a win-win, right? As opposed to outcomes where everyone's bitching at each other and annoyed at each other and shit-talking each other and stealing from each other and wasting people's time, and it's fucking chaos, okay? So it's a lot like, a, you know, say it was a country, let, let, let's say it was, a, um, you know, there's places here in LA like San Vicente Bungalow or Soho House that are private members clubs, and people know they could get kicked out at any minute. People know there's a lot of value there, so go to San Vicente Bungalow, go to Soho House. There's nobody acting the fool. There's nobody acting up. You don't see Soho House complaining, oh, well, I just feel like 
the people that are here that are being good are so fake and we always have to hold frame. So why can't we just run a shitty club that no one cares about but have them be nice anyway? You wouldn't see that, right? You wouldn't see Sam Vicente, Sam Vicente Bungalow. It's like a, like a $30,000 a year membership club or whatever. You, you know, you wouldn't see Sam Vicente Bungalow whining and bitching by the fact that they have to hold frame. No, if you want good quality people at your, at your uh, membership club, like a Soho house or something, good quality people, and you want them second of all, most important perhaps, on their best behavior, you have to have the base level value you have to have the buyer-seller dynamic. You have to have the status dynamics in place. And you got to have a motherfucking boundary. And they got to know they're going to get the boot if they get out of pocket. Does that piss you off that you have to lead and maintain that? Oh, by the way, they also have to have a vision. You know, you go to Soul House. They got, they got food. They got music. They got great crowd. You want to be part of it. You know, you come up here for a party. You come up here for a summer. It's baller. It's sick. Right? It's not just me, like, holding frame on an empty room while they sit there, like, Oh, and there's a leader, like something like that. It's like we're teaching shit. We got shit going on, baby. There's good stuff. There's stuff that you'd want to be a part of. So if that, you know, it's like this, okay? You want to see the difference? I'll show you the difference in a nutshell. Watch the comments on this in the live. And because there's no boundary right here on a YouTube live, you're going to see a bunch of dickheads posting some dumb dickhead shit. Some guy that's focused on gossip or bullshit or finding, you know, nitpicking the argument that I'm saying in ways that I'm not actually saying it at all, but making it look like that to get attention. Um, go look at that. And then, and, and also the, the uh, viewership time is going to be like three minutes and people click off. Compare that to, again, www.blueprintreloaded.com. There's an incredible community in here of people that are supportive. People, again, get inside here. You want to get inside people that are supportive. You want to get around people that are building themselves. You want to get around people that are moving forward. You want to get around people that are serious and not fucking around. Well, that's an environment to do that. Why? Because people that are in there know that if they, people that are in there are invested. People that are in there know that if they act the fool, they get kicked the fuck out. I'll wish them the best. People that are in there actually want more for themselves. People in there have a buyer seller dynamic to where they like what's being taught and they're getting results and their life's getting better from what's being taught. So you get amazing people in here. You're not gonna get a bunch of people inside Blueprint Reloaded that are saying, how big do you think is Owen's dick? Who do, you, who do you think is like the real truth of a pickup beef or whatever, right? You're not gonna see stuff like that inside there because people are actually serious about improving. Get around people that are serious about improving. Likewise, you know, you go out to Soul House, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna have a bunch of people that are acting the fucking fool. But there's elements that make that work as Soul House has to maintain frame. They have to maintain a leadership role. Now, what has to be understood is that men will also do this um, in a business relationship. And I've seen this in business relations many, many times, right? And the major key to understand is that when someone is being led, they're under your leadership, and you do not lead properly or you do not hold frame properly, and, there, and it, takes, you know, it takes some time to learn it, they will begin to do something called acting out. Okay, and I'd recommend that you even write that in the comments if that helps you, okay? Acting out, what does acting out mean? Acting out basically means that they will often just start, it's like they're pulling shits out of their ass and just throwing it around. Like, I've seen it where I've done parties here where I failed to lead, and some of the chaos that I've seen is, it's, it's, it truly defies the imagination. I mean, I've been sitting here at parties at my house where I failed to hold frame properly, and you just see a dude whip his dick out and start pissing. Like, right, like, probably right here on the floor that you see here, there's probably been a guy with his cock out just straight up pissing. No reason. You know, or like people will just like pick up things from the ground and smash it. And you'll see this in parties that get out of control. There's no leadership. People become fucking self-destructive, right? And, and that's what you'll see in relationships where if you're not holding frame, it's just like spontaneous cheating. It's like, I gotta cheat. Or like, like you'll see a lot of bitching and complaining and fault finding. And um, unfortunately what begins to happen, and this is where it gets crazy, is you will listen to the surface level content of what's being said to you by the person acting out, but they're actually shit testing you. And I don't think they're doing it on purpose. I believe it's unconscious. So I don't ever blame them for it. Um, in fact, kind of got to point the finger back at yourself, but in effect what they're doing is they are, they're giving you surface level con, um, content 
but they're they're not looking at the underlying frame because they don't even understand it. Remember I was talking earlier about like some of the podcasts where rather than just saying like, you know, they talk about like frame control and leadership and all these qualities that they, they just go like six feet, six inches, six pack, six figure, whatever, right? Because there's no frame for that. Oftentimes if you're dating somebody and you're losing frame, they don't, they just know how they feel and they just know they feel pissed off and they just know they want to act out, but they don't really know what's happening. So you go, baby, what's wrong? What's wrong? And they'll tell you what's wrong. And the problem is you kind of have to be like a detective because sometimes you're fucking up. Sometimes this person who you love is upset with you and they're trying to relay something to you and communicate to you. And you're just like, okay, well, I got to listen to what you're saying um, because I'm fucking up and and I got to hear you. And if I don't show that I hear you, you're going to feel unsafe and it's it's worse. And it's actually making the problems even worse because they're feeling unsafe. And sometimes in uh, woo-woo TikTok, they'd call that like a containing environment and so on and so forth, right? So sometimes you actually have to listen to feedback. But the problem is other times it's just a fucking shit test. And so it's almost like this game of poker where it's like, is it a bluff or is it real? Is it a shit test or is it like real feedback that I should be listening to, observing and making some changes? Because I love this person and I want them to be happy too. And it's like, which is it, right? And you get some guys that are like, it's always the shit test. Everything's a fucking shit test. Then you get these like sensitive new age guys like, just listen forever. It's all so valid. It's like the, the truth in my personal opinion and experience, I think it's somewhere in between. And you, you know, as you get older, you start getting kind of a better sense of it, of like which is acting out and which is like fucking up. Um, and what you'll notice, by the way, is that when you begin to lose the buyer-seller dynamic, when you begin to lose frame, when, you, when the status dynamic begins to shift, in effect, you start seeing the RAS flip happening. So the, 90, the 97% of things that you're doing well, they become de-emphasized. Your new identity becomes the three things that you're not doing. That becomes the new version of you. They begin to get angry at you. They begin to loop on that anger. They begin to resonate with that anger. As a result, the only things that they can even perceptually resonate with are those couple negative things. Um, that becomes a looping out of control sort of self-feeding doom loop. Um, and then, and then and it gets to the point where if you even try to sh- change the mood by being more fun or laughing, they don't even want to hear it. And they're stuck looping on that. And it's sad to say, but like, you know, whether it's like someone who you work with or a significant other or whatever it is, you're like, could we just go back to like, like how it was when, when we first met? Like when we first met, you loved me. And you know, or when we, when, when we first met, you were excited to work together or whatever, right? And like, since that time, I've done thousands of times more for you than I ever did then. Like, I was just some random guy then with the promise of maybe doing some cool things. I've, I've spent years doing things for you and you just have erased them, wiped them out. You've you made an identity of me out of the 3% that I am not. Um, you, and, and often they even start to flip your intentions. Like you have bad intentions, you're lazy, you're cheating, you don't care about them, you're unloving, you're narcissist, whatever the fuck it is, they make that identity for you. You're now the unloving, cheating, narcissist, bad guy who doesn't care. Um, all sorts of bizarre interpretations of your intentions of what you're really doing. And the fucked up thing is like, sometimes the bad stuff that they're saying is true, which then further confuses you. But the thing is, is that it's out of context. It's not that they're necessarily wrong about objectively things that happen or things that are occurring that could be bad, but they're, mis- they're, they're, they're misgaging your intentions and your love and your dedication and investment. And what they're doing is they are, um, um, they've wiped out the 97% of things that you're doing and they're just looping on this. And so, and so then what you start doing is you say to yourself, well, I'm going to listen to the content of what they're saying and try to fix it. So you, you're fixing it at content level but what's happening is you're not reestablishing that leadership, that frame, that buyer seller dynamic, that status dynamic. You're not going back to that. And so you're causing the acting out, you're causing the RES flip, you're causing the implosion. And then because they feel guilty about it, they often have to like literally just like partition their identity of who they were in the past. That person basically dies and they, bec- they create a new identity for the next person who they're with or the next environment that they're with. And it, it's sort of sad because um, you really did love that other person that existed. And it's like, I'm okay with not having you in my life, but like, it just makes me sad that that beautiful person that I knew turned, well, sort of dissolved or like transmogrified into like this other thing. And you still love them. And like, you know, it it can even get to the point where if they have that flip, um, you could call the person on the phone, but it really is almost like you'd have to establish a brand new relationship from scratch. And because they're different, you may not even resonate with each other anymore. They may not resonate with you anymore. 
and you probably don't resonate with them. So even it's like like behind lucky prize door number one would be like a person you no longer resonate with because they've changed. And the reason why that happens, you have to understand, is because they have to make sure that they don't go back to you. So it's a biological defense mechanism to make sure that they don't get back, go back to you. They're, they're, they have the RAS flip, um, they start acting out, make a new identity, and then within a new containing environment or a new person who is um, better with the frame than you are, they may maintain that new uh, sweet person. This is actually why, by the way, I'm never afraid of like, like if a girlfriend of mine is talking to an ex, because I know that like she's probably a different person than who she was with the ex. I know that she no longer resonates with him. I know that she's RES with the guy. The last person that I'm afraid of a girl talking to is her ex because I know it's dead. I know it's dead in the fucking water. It's done. Um, at least in most cases, particularly if the girl left, right? In that 70 to 80% of the girl leaving and so on and so forth, right? Well, let's look a little bit more then at why that happens. And actually, we could talk about that whole like 70 to 80% of girls leaving thing. And, and, and we could talk about the RES flip, why it's happening. I mean, and then we talk about how men do this too. Okay, so here's the basic underlying dynamic that you have to understand. This dynamic occurs, the hypergamy dynamic, RES flipping, acting out, new identity, all that stuff, rationalization, forgetting conveniently what happened, all that stuff, decontextualization, creating a new identity out of you. All this stuff is happening because what you don't realize is this. Okay, so let's say you yourself are a five or a six in looks. And let's say that you're dating someone who's a nine or a 10. Well, there's a gap there, right? So you're gonna frame it to you like it's just someone who I love and they were mean to me. But it wasn't as though, you know, you went out to the, uh, the local Dairy Queen, found the fattest person that you could and showered them with love and they betrayed you. Rather, what you probably did if you learned social skills was you went out, met a lot of people, uh, got really good at meeting people, did approaches, did parties, and at the upper edge of who you're able to meet, you got into a relationship with somebody. Likewise, in business, you probably didn't go into business with the first scrub that you found. You found the most talented person. So you took somebody who had a high degree of optionality, and whether it's a talented guy that you're working with or a talented girl that you're working with around money, or maybe in dating, you chose them, and you're framing it like it's all innocent. Like, I just gave you all my love, and look what you did. And I know that it can feel that way and I've felt that way and I've, I've fallen into that and felt bitter about it and all that stuff. And it's, it's hurtful for sure. It, is, it, it's, it really fucking stings. I mean, it's like, a, you know, like your head's being beaten in and you're kind of in a low consciousness and there's only so many ways that you can process at that given time. Like later you, you have perspective on it, right? And you start to take some of your own responsibility unless you're one of those hey, pergamy guys and blame the whole world but yourself. And I guess you could do that if you want to, because it's just too tiring and hard. So the juice isn't worth the squeeze to evolve into a grown man that can lead. Okay. So then basically what it is, is that, um, okay. So you basically chose someone with high, high optionality. So you're framing it in your mind as I'm offering you my love. I'm offering you my perhaps monogamy, or I'm offering you my business partnership, or I'm offering you uh, to work with you or to hire you or for you to hire me or whatever, right? You're, you're saying that you're just, you're framing yourself as this um, blameless value giver and that they are the people who cannot receive the value. But in saying, oh, you'd be my significant other or business partner or whatever, you're not really saying, I just want to give you stuff. Really what you're saying is I want you to shut doors. I don't want you to take that private plane to Dubai. I don't want you to date that six foot two jacked giga chat. I don't want you to go into business on your own where you don't have to split the cut. I want you to keep, I want you to give me a part of the cut and you get less of the cut. I want you to work for me when you had other job opportunities. I want you to hire me when you, cause maybe it could be for you, someone, someone hiring you. I want you to hire me when you could have hired somebody else, right? So in effect, when, when someone's dealing with you, you are basically saying to them, you're gonna, there's all these reality tunnels that you could go down in exchange for whether it's sex or money or time or energy or focus or whatever. You're gonna take these limited resources, time, money, sex, energy, folks, whatever. You're gonna take these limited resources and then you're going to give them to me conveniently. But now I didn't lead properly and hold frame properly and I am mad. And so I'm gonna talk about female nature. Even though of course it's male nature and human nature, but I'm gonna say the human nature is female nature. Um, or I'm gonna say hypergamy with bitterness, or I'm going to get pissed off. But I mean, for example, if you're in a business, 
you literally could be making millions, perhaps in a extreme version, billions of dollars because all these people give up on their own billion dollar business. Not to say that everybody has a drive for that, obviously, right? But let's just say in theory, like as for the sake of argument, they're giving up their billion dollar business to work in your billion dollar business and they're all doing it. Well, all they're asking for is that you hold the goddamn frame. Excuse my French, right? But it's like, you know, they're, they're really not asking for much. Like, can you create a containing environment where I can shut off my brain a little bit and exist within your frame? Right, so in effect, when you have a significant other or an employee, you know, or a business partnership, you're saying, I want you to engage with my frame. You're not just gonna be in your frame, you're going to enter into my frame. You're going to enter into the vision that I have, the vision for this relationship, the vision who you're gonna become, the vision who we're gonna become, and so on and so forth, and you know, you gotta lead that. And if you lead it well, um, they're bought in, they're often bought in for life, and then some little dickhead like me comes along at a bar club and I go, uh, you know, and try to do my little song and dance, and it doesn't work. Because let me tell you something, for all the different cases that I see where my little charming maneuvers are not gonna work, it's not because um, the guy has like the girl who doesn't have hypergamy, no. It's the guy who just knows how to lead that is not gonna have that problem. And oftentimes when I interact with mixed guy girl groups, you just see the girl just, just grab the guy's head and start making out with them. And then he just winks at me and he walks off with this girl and it kind of was like probably part of their foreplay for the night and nothing happens at all. So, you see, so you're sitting there and you're going, oh, it's so bad, the cheating, the cheating, the cheating, but not realizing there's many cases where there's not cheating, but it's not because of the low hypergamy threshold girl. And while some women probably have cluster B, maybe some had to have a bad relationship with their dad and that can impact things for sure. It's not, the, it's not even as much of a driving factor as just who you are as a man. Now, obviously, the non-cluster B, better relationship with the parents, or maybe more spiritually aware, maybe someone who had, a, I've, had I've had women in my life that had a rough relationship with their dad but became spiritually aware and they really elevated. Well, you know, it, it's not, like, like, don't worry as much about that. Like, you know, I've, I've dated strippers that were so ride or die like, you know, and I know you're, you're saying like, what, what is a stripper? And I just didn't really care if they kept doing it. You know, probably I wasn't planning to get married. But the point is like, I have had, I, I think of some of my stripper ex-girlfriends, like, like dancers that were so ride or die. I mean, you almost had like, you could, you could be like, like you could literally, like if you, if you'd have to be careful not to joke to like go stab somebody. Like you'd be like, you could joke, like cut him baby. And like, you could say that as a joke and like, She'd be running over there to do it. Like, baby, no, it's a joke. It was a joke. It was a joke. I was a joke. You know, like, like, daddy, I'll do it. Daddy, I'll do it. Like, loyalty, like, ride or die loyalty. Many different uh, dancers that I've dated ride or fucking die to the bone. Okay? Now, you may be riding the wild stallion. I mean, you are riding the wild fucking stallion. You know, you're dating an exotic dancer. Uh, maybe some girl doing a lot of OnlyFans, things like that. I get it. Maybe they're not your cup of tea. I get it. I've kind of done the full range of like, you know, the more classical, like religious girls, OnlyFans, stripper, PhD, lawyer, accountant. I've done, I've done all of it. And I can tell you, like, there was not really a correlation between like the accountant girl and the stripper. Like many, many, many different strippers were like so fucking ride or die. I've been, I've been blessed to have some ride or die women in my life, like seriously blessed. Major, major ride or die. Um, but that was also probably because in some way they viewed the stripping as a conspiracy where it was like, you know, it's like daddy, you know, I'm going to work, like these guys are chumps, you know, and like, like they're going to work and like they kind of want to like, you know, bring back their best energy to you, right? Like they view those guys as kind of like the beta male clowns, giving them the provisions and they view you as the alpha. So it's like, these different things that you're talking about with like quality and cheating and whatnot, while I do think that, you know, avoiding cluster B, challenging relationships with parents, lack of spirituality, drugs, so on, helps you, I can, I mean, even girls that are like drugged out of their fucking mind, like coked out, like strippers, and again, that to me is a little much, that's a little heavy. Um, you know, I've been around a lot over the years, but that's a little heavy for me. But the point being is like, the ride or die girl, it's, I mean, a lot of the time, those girls are so much the wild stallion that the one guy who can come in and actually lead, there's, it's such a breath of fresh air, they're so happy that they're even more ride or die. So the ride or die component 
and things like loyalty is, a, is it's really a lot more predicate on your ability to inspire loyalty than it is on these other components. And look, I can tell you the same thing when it comes to business, it's the same thing. Um, I mean, I've had a lot of betrayal in business and while I like discussing it so that people can understand the underlying dynamics in that, I have to understand like, I am the common denominator in that. Like, I mean, we, like you'll never see me kind of pointing, like you notice I don't really air dirty laundry. And the reason why I don't air dirty laundry, and I'm actually very grateful even, like even for people who stole from me and other men that like literally shoved a knife in my heart in, in deep betrayals that blew my mind and it's just like unfathomable, but you'll not really see me hold it against them because in my view, learning leadership, the way that I see it, it was like, well, hey, you allowed me to lead yeah, what you did is pretty horrible. <laughs> I'm not trying to like, you know, like excuse, like, like, you know, victim shame myself or something. But while I don't want to like victim shame myself, yada, 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 um, not that I care about that word, but I'm just, you know, trying to be funny. I understand that like they gave me a chance to lead. I was able via that process of iteration to see where I went wrong rather that, you know, you can get bitter or better. And via that process of seeing where I had a chance to lead and where I fucked up, I say thank you. Look, like clearly you're cool. Clearly we like each other. Clearly there's a friendship here. We have a camaraderie. We have things that we like about each other, but I kind of did ask you to give up other opportunities to ha have me lead. Your DNA, your biology kicked in when I became a weak leader. It caused you to have an RES flip, maybe caused you to create a new identity because you have to partition the shame of the betrayal. You left, but you gave me a chance to learn. And we had some good times. And I'm just gonna focus on that and I'm gonna focus on being a better leader. And that's how I feel from what I've been cheated on. Um, there's been women in my life that were very ride or die. I, you know, they started, you know, I, I got a little beaten down. You know, maybe work was rough for a while, start, you know, getting me on a payroll and, you know, bills piling up and I'm just like, and you know what's funny too, let me tell you another thing. Women really will live under a bridge with you when you're broke. They really fucking will. Women are not, I would wish for my own convenience as a person running a business that women were gold diggers. Like bring on the gold diggers. I don't see a lot of gold diggers. Gold diggers is like a fetish where in the five love languages books, some women are gifters. They just love gifts. Like my ex CJ, she's a uh, CJ spark. She's a little bit famous on uh, social media. Like she's got a little good little following going and um, good, good size following. And CJ, you know, she's kind of uh, famous for being someone who's a gifter, right? And she'll talk about how like in past relationships, like guys didn't give her gifts and she realized now she loves gifts. I was kind of, the, she's one of my best friends still. We hang out regularly. But like I'm one of the guys that didn't give her a lot of gifts. So like we kind of joke about that. <laughs> um, I was like one of the worst gifters. But um, you know, CJ loves gifts, right? Like CJ, to her credit, I remember once I gave her a leather jacket and um, it was an Alexander McQueen leather jacket. I'd bought one uh, and it was matching. I got, her, I got myself a leather jacket and I got her a matching leather jacket and she lost her fucking mind. I mean, she literally looked like she was gonna start squirting like in her car chair. She was like, oh, oh, like she was shaking, twitching. Like she was in, she was like elated just cause she got a gift. Like that's just, that, that's really her, like you might call that a hoe, but it's really her love language. Like, you know, for a lot of people, um, they say gifters, and maybe it's a bit of a rationalization, but they say with gifters, they, they love gifts because it's something that is a symbol of your love. And even when you're not present, they can kind of hold it and have, and have a symbol there, right? You know, I, in, my, in a previous relationship, I, had, I remember the girl had asked me for a ring and I was a total dickhead. And she was so cool about it. She was like, she wasn't asking me for a diamond ring. She was like, could you just get me like a, like a, a cute blue crystal? And I was such a dick and I never got it. And I, to this day, I'm like, want to vomit when I think of myself like that. But just so, she's so easy to please, right? She wasn't needing a $6,000 diamond ring. She, she would have appreciated it, but she didn't need it. She just wanted a symbol. But I was like, no, Piper, <laughs> like whatever the fuck I was thinking. You know, so it's like, um, and I'm sad about that and I own that, you know, and, and the thing, and I'm apologize for, but the point being is like all those girls that I've been with, like they would have lived with me under a bridge. Like I could leave this house. They would live with me under a bridge any day of the week. Here was my problem. I allowed challenges in the business and other challenges I had to affect my swag. And you know, the winner effect as we call it goes down and um, they feel the winter effect going down and you know, they have biology and hundred million years of biology. And I'm like, you should just help me. And I'm just weakening and I'm collapsing. And um, 
you know, the RAS flip kicks in and then you get into a death spiral, you get into a doom spiral where the RAS flip is kicked in, uh, they now create the identity of you out of the 3%, not the 97%, they believe it. You love the girl, so you, um, you listen to her, even though she probably thinks you're not listening to her, but you are. And you take it serious and then you try to fix it at the content level. And what's, what's incredibly confusing is that a lot of the content they're saying is bad stuff that you're doing that you kind of feel bad about and you want to fix if you care about her, right? And then you start focusing on that and how do you fix it? <sighs> and um, you know, the leadership is, at, it's the structure, not the content. That's the problem. But some of the, but, but it's a gray area because some of the content is the problem. You know, so it, like in other words, you know, say that you're having that problem and then the girl's losing attraction for you. Maybe you're like, baby, I'll get you the blue ring. But then by then it's too late and you know, it's, it's too little too late. And what happens is that, um, you know, it's a shame, right? But what happens at that point is that you try to fix it at content level, here's the ring. But ironically, it actually works against you at that point. They no longer want it from you. And it appears manipulative. Or say that you're in the business, right? And your business partner was like, you know, I want a certain amount of emails sent out, or I want a certain amount of check-ins, or I want a certain amount of lead generation, or I want a certain amount of targets reach. And they've already flipped you well, you go do all the things they ask and they just view it as you kind of suck in their dick metaphorically and they view it like you're pandering them and they view that effort that you're putting in as you, because the buyer-seller dynamic gets skewed and then they view it that you're trying to now get something from them. So by you listening to their complaints, they view it as you self-qualifying, so you're in a pit. And breaking out of one of those uh, spirals is one of the hardest things you could ever do, I'm telling you. Um, it's almost like an airplane that's like in a, in this like, it's like spitting out of control and you're somehow trying to level the damn plane. And I'll tell you some of my lowest moments that I could say, like, like, let me, let me like confess some of like the dumbest things I've done in my whole life. Um, like I remember one girl who I love dearly, I will always love dearly. And you know, it means it's like the world to me. But I remember like, she was always just like in that acting out mode. And I remember, um, I think I remember saying some like, like, and this is just so stupid. But I remember I was like, I was so frustrated. I was like, Maybe what I should do is I should just start running parties again and then you'd like see it and then finally you'd respect me because like look at all the shit I'm doing, right? And the funny thing is like, where do you think that's going to get you? You know, like what's she going to say? Oh, yes. Oh, I'm so wet now. Yes, baby. Like run parties to make me jealous. So I'll respect you. Like that's not going to work. Um, but then ironically, like you're in this, you're, 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 you're stuck in, in between two walls. Cause like you go get the blue ring and that's not going to work, you know, and you, you try, I never got the blue ring, but you know, I try stuff like that and do my best. So you're, you're lit, you know, so you, you spend the extra time you do, you know, and it's like, then you spend the extra time with them and then the business is scaling more. And then you're kind of just like doing the extra time with them to, to try to like stabilize that while the business is failing. And this is what happens as a dude, right? Like this happens for real. And the relationship one, I mean, you might think that sounds a little harsh, but the business one, I've had that happen even far, far worse. Um, I've had it where the business is structured where like, you know, there's a certain amount of baseline expenses and then there's people that I'm working with that, that, are, that have kind of, unfortunately, through my stupidity and misunderstanding of business, I've allowed them to create sort of a black box where there's processes that they understand that I'm fucked without and it's gonna cause revenue collapse. And I have seen this get to the point where men, not women, but men in their money hypergamy, what they do is they get to the point where they see that you need something and that same sweet person that when you first started working with them, they were all positive and all fun and all that, they start demanding more money, more value, more attention. Well, what happens? Again, you look at content over structure, you start giving them the stuff that they're demanding, which then removes your time to fix the actual systems that would either A, make them redundant because you could, build, you could build out revenue around them and then you don't need them anymore and then they'd actually respect you again or you could at least learn what they're doing so that if they leave, you're not fucked, but you don't have time for that so now you're pandering, 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 pandering. They're seeing it. They get further enraged because now they're acting out, creating that new identity out of you um, and they're in a loop and they're in that loop of needing to remove, remove you from leadership. Now, why does this happen? Okay, it's biological, um, but it's also psychological because in effect, when they came under your leadership, they entered into your frame. And so now what's happening is that they are seeing at a biological level that your frame ain't cutting it. Your frame ain't cutting it. 
And I hate to say it, but a lot of this stuff is kind of what have you what have you done for me lately? Like, you know, you could have been winning with them for a long time, but unfortunately there is a biological component here. It's 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 egregious and it's frustrating, but it's true that if you're a leader, you gotta embrace this, right? You can be we can sit here and complain about it all day, or we can again read the sermon on the mount, we can forgive, and we can just fucking lead and win. So, you know, it's like if you're gonna say, like, yeah. Don't go on that guy in the private chat. Don't go with the giga chat. Hey, don't have that other business partner. Hey, don't keep all the money for yourself. Hey, come work for me. You know, or or whatever situation where there's a value, you're, you're blocking somebody else from getting what they could. You're blocking their options. You're blocking their resources. You're blocking the reality tunnels that they could go down so that they can be in your frame. And you're saying, be in my frame. Be under my leadership. Well, when they're doing that, they're in. They're living inside your frame. Which means that a lot of their um, values will mirror and match your values. A lot of their focus will mirror and match your focus because they're under your protection and leadership and guidance, right? Well, you're getting the benefit from that. It could be sexual, it could be money, whatever. You're getting the benefit from that. But then you're trying to frame it as like a friendship like how a seven-year-old has. Like you're my best friend from when I'm seven years old. So I want like that kind of loyalty of like two best friends at age seven. But the funny thing is, that girl would have lived with you under the bridge if you just would have kept your swag. She didn't leave because she lost access to your credit card. That'd be less than 5% of women. I, maybe 1%, could be less. She left because your winner effect went down, your swagger went down. All those things that work in attraction out in the field, there's some maintenance of that in a relationship and that went away. And it, it's the same thing in business, right? Like that person who came and to work for you or with you and partnered with you, whatever it is, they viewed you on a pedestal and then that got eroded. Now understand that that pedestalization and depedestalization is one of the biggest things that you need to understand. If you're gonna ask someone to cut out their options, you have to maintain pedestalization. So I think a simple way to understand that if you wanna understand what it means to be pedestalized would be, um, and this would help you a lot, Go to Rodeo Drive or go, you know, go, um, you know, to, uh, what's that mall in Miami that's like the baller mall where the Goyard store is? Whatever that one is, you know, like these super baller, uh, you know, the super, whatever the baller mall is in Miami anyway. There's a fashion district. There's a sick ass mall. Um, maybe you could look it up. And then, um, you know, go to that mall. Uh, is it Biscayne Bay? Is this, anyway, yeah. So, um, you know, look up Goyard Miami, right? But go to that mall. Um, you know, go to, you know, go to New York, go to Michigan Avenue in, uh, is it Michigan Avenue, Superior Avenue, whatever the fuck. Anyway, I'm off my game today. Um, but the point being, go to these beautiful stores and watch how they sell luxury clothing. Go to a Rolex store, a Patek Philippe store, an Audemars Piguet store. Go to a Lamborghini uh, place and so on and so forth and look at things like what it, you know, how the buyer seller dynamic gets skewed and in effect, don't worry about it, my member, we're okay. But yeah, basically just look at it for or Ball Harbor. Was it Ball Harbor? Okay, yeah, Ball yeah Harbor. okay, we're good. Okay, so Ball Harbor, thank you. So what it is is like, it's one of these things where go to, go to the Goyard store at Ball Harbor and notice how you kind of wait outside in line, you come in, there's a snobby French person there who like, you know, lets you kind of feel privileged to be there. It's a basic maintenance of frame and I think it would be wise of you to observe that in who you're with. And look, if you're a woman, you have a husband, remember that like, you know, when he's seeing you without, and I don't think a woman has to wear makeup all the time. I think women look great natural too. So she's a beautiful woman. But the point is like, or any woman can if the man loves you, but l at least have like a day a week where the guy sees you like, like balling out. You know, remind the motherfucker, yo, I'm that bitch. Like, let him see that shit. Let him see a bunch of chodes fucking eyeing you out if you're a girl. You know what I'm saying, right? Or in whatever, whatever value it was that attracted him in the first place, got to give him a little reminder. Sometimes you need a, as Ty Lopo would said it, you got to give him a reminder. Let him see that, you know? And so for the rest of my life, I don't care if I'm married or what would happen. I will always keep doing parties in my house. I'm not going to do what I did in the past. Like, I'm going to do parties, you know? No, I'm not gonna do that, but I'll always do parties. Maybe it'd be a poker game. Maybe it would be like, you know, a business networking thing. But I'm always gonna have other people around, not to create anxiety, just to be social. Um, I'm never gonna allow myself to get out of shape in a relationship again, okay? I've been back in the gym for um, about a year and a half. I've gained a ton of strength in the gym. I've been doing crazy amounts of cardio of late. I think I recently dropped about 12, 13 pounds. Hopefully I'll be ripped again by next year. And the thing is like, I'll just do that just not even for physical attraction. Usually the girls I'm with are not with me out of physical attraction. 
but I'll do it out of kind of a swagger component. I'm always gonna make sure that I'm aware of what it means to lead, I get that. And I'm not gonna be mad at women for that. I'm not gonna hold it against them because I gotta tell you something. I've had the opportunity to be around some of the most loyal, ride or die women ever born, you know? And I think that if you, at a certain point, like you've got to start to look at yourself as the common denominator of these problems. And really the, the, the real bitterness of the hypergamy thing, whether it's male, like towards like male RAS flips or, or women, is just, I think that we could actually see it at the root as like that 97% versus 3% part and the RAS flip. That's what creates the bitterness and that's what creates the confusion. And unfortunately, the legal system can also be weaponized in lawfare by people who go into that 3%, right? So let's say that you get married and you really did your best and you try to be a good provider, right? But you, you, you failed in the leadership part and then they go into that 3% where they hate you. That 3% thing where they hate you is a biological mechanism to get them to exit your frame. That RAS flip is a biological mechanism to make sure they don't get impregnated by a beta male. That RAS flip where they focus on the 3% and make a new identity of you is to make sure that if you're in a business partner, partnership male to male, that they don't get fucked over by an incompetent leader or an incompetent business partnership. So they don't wind up fucked. These are biological mechanisms that have been put in place by evolution for many, many years to protect somebody. But unfortunately with things like lawsuits or divorce, um, that thing where the person kind of can kind of hate you can be weaponized and now all of a sudden there's this huge legal apparatus designed to fuck you in the ass by someone who like really loved you and probably has a lot of underlying love for you but that's partitioned away that they're unconscious to and they're focusing on 3% and made a new identity out of you and now all of a sudden like you know you see these couples in court where they're glaring at each other and they fucking hate each other and you know in nature if this was like a caveman tribe that would just cause the couple to separate and to kind of move on with their lives but now all of a sudden you have all these entanglements and it gets really crazy, right? And same thing with like, you know, suing and, and all that kind of stuff, like lawfare and all that, where, um, you know, partners that once like really had love for each other um, can actually start to hate each other. And, you know, you've seen that in a lot of partnerships in our, in our community and stuff like that, where these people hate each other and they really don't hate each other. I don't, I don't think like a lot of these ex-partnerships hate each other. I think they have underlying love for each other. But what I also think is that that RAS slip thing just takes over. And unfortunately, and, and here's kind of what it is, here's the way it pans out. Once the RAS flip has happened, the person is sort of going with what their, bio, bi, what their biological imperative is getting them to do, but they have cognitive dissonance because they also see themselves as a loyal person and it's painful. And as a result of that, the only ways around it are either to, um, you know, basically to permanently RAS flip you or, and here's the other part, when they exit your frame, their value shift, their identity shifts, their focus shifts, and now you're talking to somebody on the phone, but it's literally somebody who you can't relate with anymore. And they'll sort of partition what happened and perhaps blame themselves. But while I do think that there's certainly a percentage of the blame that you could put on someone, I agree with that. I don't, I'm not like, again, trying to victim shame. If this has happened to you more than once or more than a handful of times, who's the common denominator? Was that really the best that you could do? What, is this not something that you could learn to solve? When Soho House or San Vicente Bungalow have a $30,000 membership and everybody's super cool, was there not a formula that you could use that would hold that in place? Is there not formulas and understandings of this stuff? that allow, like when I run a seminar and everyone's super cool, or when I do a party and everyone's super cool, are there not things that I have learned that allow me to do that? And you're like, well, I don't wanna have to do that, it's too much work, I just want someone to ride or die. It's like, well, you kinda earn that, especially when you're cutting off other people's options by being with you, and it's formulaic. Like when I'm running a seminar, you, a lot of you watching this have been to my seminars, you, perhaps you've been to one of my seminars, if not, try to get to one. It's, it's not a lot of work, it's fairly effortless. It, it's just a basic understanding of leadership. It's similar to if you walk down the street, you don't get hit by a car. It's not like this permanently taxing thing, you know, and you're like, no, I wanna walk down the street in the middle of the road and not get hit, and you're mad about how reality works. Don't be mad about how reality works. Simply understand that hypergamy 
yes, women do that. The hypergamy dynamic occurs a lot with men and women because a lot of the time your attraction for the woman stays relatively stable because her looks stay stable. But your value as a man, again, if to love a woman, you have to love hypergamy, you could be a five, raise your value to a 10, but then it shot back down to a five because it's, it's centered and pivoted around your behavior. So you're not, you're not stuck in a static form of value. So it gives the appearance that women are doing that. What if women's appearance was shifting to ugly to hot, ugly to hot, ugly to hot, ugly to hot? Well, then you might act in a similar way. What if you're in a business and your boss seems smart, 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 dumb, 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 beating down, beating down, beating down, and then that behavior goes up and up. Well, then your behavior could change. So these are dynamics that occur when, again, here's the formula. Someone is giving up options of the reality tunnels they could go down, just cool life experiences they could have, financial resources, sexual resources, any, any form of like concrete value, they're giving that up to be with you and they're living inside your frame. And again, if you don't lead, they RAS flip as a biological, hundreds of millions of years evolutionary mechanism. They RAS flip, they, they move, they decontextualize the 97% good that you did and who you, all the beauty of how much you love them. They question your intentions, motives, questions who you are as a person, lock it on the 3% they don't agree with. That's a biological mechanism. It is unstoppable. It will not change. That happens, they exit, and then when they exit, they're no longer in your frame, which means their personality changes dramatically. But likewise, in order to make themselves exit, they might also create so much pain around you that even when you try to talk to them, it's just met with pain, and they're actually, they, they just gotta go. And that's it, you fucked up, you're done. Okay, so what are the ways in which I can hold a seminar well, or hold a relationship well, or hold a business partnership well? What are the things that I've learned? Right? Are, are we gonna go, let's make a podcast, Shaving Hypergamy, are we gonna do that? And again, like, I love all those podcasts, but like, are we gonna do that? Or are we gonna say, okay, well, what are the things that work? A, ma understand status, maintain it. B, understand buyer-seller dynamic, maintain it. C, learn to tell when there's a complaint, if it's structural to the, the dynamic that you're establishing, surrounding status and, and buyer-seller dynamic, or, and, and it's them acting out, or is it something real that you need to address? Like the blue ring thing that I should have. Um, or maybe giving a couple more gifts to CJ. <laughs> hey, babe. Okay, so then from there, okay, then you go, um, so you, you have to start to see that. And then the fifth one, what I'd say, is a compelling vision. Where are you taking this? Are you actually leading this in a direction that they can see? And do they see sustained value, okay? So having a vision, right? Maybe, maybe a girl leaves you when she realizes that, or she feels at least that you're never gonna marry her. And she has that perception, doesn't trust you anymore, doesn't trust your words anymore. You know, and then, and then if you did go pop the ring, too little, too late. She, it just looks like you're self-qualifying, kills it, right? But it's, you know, I'm not saying that you have to marry someone, that's your choice. But what I'm saying, especially with the danger of RS flips and probably would be good to know about prenups, but the point is, um, there's not a vision there, right? Or some, if you're not gonna get married, well then what is the vision? Are you gonna have kids, so on and so forth, right? So, you know, you keep kicking the can down the road on that, person can lose trust in you. You come back later, no baby, I'll give you a kid. But again, now it's, now you're in the 3%. They don't trust it anymore. It looks like you're self-qualifying. You lose even more status. Fucks the structural thing. Hard to break out of the tailspin. So I'd say you have to have a vision. Another thing I hate to say, and I'm not trying to be mean about it, but you gotta have options. So in other words, let's say in a relationship, you, you just do a little poker game. You don't gotta start hitting on anybody, nothing like that, nothing crazy. Just have a little poker game. Just reminds them like, hey, there's, you know, there's other people here that have respect for this person. Maybe you're a girl, maybe you doll up a little bit. Your, your man is looking at all these girls on Instagram with face tune and fucking makeup and blow dried hair and they've been preparing for three hours for that photo. You know, you get up to actually like help clean the damn kitchen, but that you get penalized for that. Likewise, you're a provider for the girl. You're working hard to take her on a nice trip, but you get penalized for that, right? We penalize each other for lack of halo effect. Now, obviously a good relationship isn't just centered around a halo effect, but a halo effect is a component, right? An entire relationship's not about sex, but sex is a component. Good sex in all too, right? Put that in. <laughs> That's number one, two, three, four, five. But you know my point, right? Like good sex, but options. And once you begin to understand this stuff, like again, I effortlessly can run a club, like just you know, socialize in a whole club and just take over. I can effortlessly run a seminar. I can effortlessly do videos. I can effortlessly do parties. And over time, I've learned a lot about relationships. And I've definitely fucked up. I mean, man, man have I fucked up. You know, it's... Uh, the, the best way I could, I'll kind of leave you this. It's death, when you fuck up, it's death by a thousand cuts. And I call it dynamic slippage. It's like this slight slippage in the dynamic and it's death 
by a thousand cuts. So by the end of it, by the way, once you're in that um, in that loophole where where they're seeing you as a three percent, oftentimes if you love that person, whether it's and I've had this happen with again with men in business or relationships, you could start to take on that identity. Like they have that bad perception of you, and you like you kind of start to feel like you're that person. And you know you go you go back to maybe creating a new business partnership or a new romantic relationship, and you know you kind of have to like shake off a lot of that perception of you and that new identity identity that you might have taken on and you know you go back out and like people are treating you amazing and you think to yourself man like if the last person again business romantic whatever like would have just seen me like that even like if they would have even been a third as excited on an ongoing basis as this new person is that I've done nothing for I never would have left but somehow, some way, I lost that dynamic. I got in this tailspin and I was not able to correct it. And uh, unfortunately, in a lot of these cases, the only thing to do is to separate. And that sounds kind of lame, doesn't it, right? Because it's, it's, I believe in togetherness, so it's like, is that really all you can do is just separate? Man, that sucks. That is really shitty. Um, and I wish I, had a, I wish I had better news for you, but I don't really have a big track record of like fixing something once it goes like that. It sort of has its own momentum or trajectory that's like a runaway train. And a lot of the time you just go, well, I mean, kind of like being out at a club, you know, you do an open, it doesn't go anywhere. And like, you could try to go back and be like, hey, look, I'm cool. But like, they kind of have that perception of you. Unfortunately, like even in a longer relationship, they can have that perception of you. And there's really not a lot you could do to reverse it. Like even, like, even people that I work with, for example, like could watch this video and like, I don't think that this would get them to re-remember all the love and effort and attention and, and um, intention that I put into those partnerships. I think they just see it and they'd be like, oh, it's like some excuse or try to demonize me or, you know, like I don't think they'd see it differently. I think like once that switch happens, there's real biology put in place that says like, I will not enter back in that person's frame. So even what you say, there's a fear of going back in your, into your frame. But see, here's, here's why you're ma mad at that and you don't get their perspective. You're mad at it because when you were leading, you weren't really in their frame. They were in your frame. So you don't have that kind of fear of engulfment of being put back into their frame. But what if, you, what if it was someone who like didn't lead you properly and then you were kind of like really in that frame but it wasn't good or healthy for you anymore? And you were feeling a lot of inner resistance around it, and a lot of conflict around your loyalty to the situation and wanting to be loyal, but you can, your, your biology screaming you to get out. Hundreds of millions of years of evolution versus your loyalty. Prefrontal cortex versus DNA, right? And your, your brain just kind of kicks in and says, I, like in the same way that like, you know, you touched a stove and it burned you and you're just not able to touch it again, your, their biology just won't let them go back in your frame, right? So where I've been able to reestablish friendships with exes is when maybe they've been in some other guy's frame for a while, then that broke up. They're completely healed from our past relationship. Um, me and CJ, for example, you know, me and CJ were publicly a couple for a long time and now we're like very, very tight. Like it, it's almost like creepy how tight me and CJ are as friends who don't have sex and we're just the best of friends. We've known each other for years. We, we have genuine fun hanging out. Like I'd, I'd rather go skiing or go to dinner with CJ than like some random girl that I would have sex with. Like I just enjoy her company. She's a buddy, like same way as like a guy friend. And I know that sounds hard to believe, but we have like old men and women can't be friends. No, she's my friend because I like that she's been in my life, right? But she's kind of like, you know, I've had relationships, she's had relationships. And she's not afraid of being in my frame again. And I'm not afraid of like being in her frame again. So as a result of that, you know, we can kind of joke about what happened. We had a, we were in a dialogue cafe the other day and I bought her a, a chicken bowl and she was like, oh, are you going to buy it? She likes gifts, right? And I, and I was like, um, uh, and I always just said, blurt out whatever the fuck is I'm thinking. I didn't even say it was any on purpose. I just blurted out. And I, I blurted out. I was like, well, hey, because she's like, are you going to buy this for me? And I blurted out in the whole restaurant here. It's like, oh, hey. You know, you didn't get the ring. You might as well at least get a fucking protein bowl. And like the whole restaurant just started laughing. And she's like, well, it better be a good protein bowl, Owen. You know, right? And she was laughing. And like, you know, we kind of had those moments where we could sort of joke about what happened. Like we can joke about, you know, what happened. And you know, I had to, like when I reestablished my friendship with her, you know, I had to go to her and like really show her like a deep regret. And like, I'm sorry the pain I caused you, you know, and like really show real emotion to show her that like, the pain you feel, I feel. 
you know, and she did exit my frame. But we're friends now, and it's a real, genuine friendship. Like, I think her and I will always have some attraction for each other, but like, it's a genuine, genuine, real friendship. Because we're not, she's not afraid of going into my frame and being engulfed. So she's not RES flipping me, and, as a, and, and, and I'm also not RES flipping her, and we're friends. And this is what you have to understand, like, they get this hypergamy thing, the RES flip thing, and, and the demonizing you thing, as a way to jettison themselves when you fail to lead. But if you come back genuinely as a friend, after it's cooled off, after the, you know, the pain's been processed, after maybe they've had a new experience with other people, whatever, you can be friends again. And you can have that same love for each other and like genuine friendship. And me and her are hilarious. Like, you know, we'll be hanging out and, and, we, and like we get along better than when we were a couple. And like people will think we're a couple and then they'll go, oh, are you guys like a couple? And we're like, exes. And, uh, and, and people are like, it blows their fucking mind. They're like, what the fuck? Your exes? And then they, it fucks them up because they're like, Does, could I like do this with my ex? Like, you're not gonna like go have sex? Like, you're not mad at each other, you know? And like, of course her and I probably like, you know, there's like a, like a drop of that in there somewhere, but we genuinely have fun because we did have a friendship. Like we, like when you really love somebody, it's not about what you're getting from them. It's actually about genuine friendship. And that's what the, the thing that I think is beautiful about human beings is like the capacity to love art the capacity to have a pet, the capacity to have a real friendship, the capacity to appreciate nature. These are things that are, that are sort of superfluous. Like these are not necessary things for our survival, right? You know, animals, they, they, they're probably more just like in a more primitive state. We choose to love. We choose to appreciate art. We choose to create. We choose to go into nature. So if you've ever read an incredible book, it's called The Little Prince. Beautiful book. You gotta, you gotta read this. You, you want a girl to like, melt for you, give her the little prince. That's like, it's better than giving her a, a car, okay? Maybe, <laughs> no, but like kind of is, emotionally for sure. Give her the, the book, The Little Prince, incredible gift if the girl like really loves you. If you're trying to like, you know, hook up with her, give her The Little Prince, probably scare her, but if, you, if she loves you. But like, basically the story of The Little Prince, and I'll leave you with this, is The Little Prince is on, is on a, a small little planet and he has one little rose and he loves that rose. The rose is even a bit bitchy. Funny what that's supposed to look like, right? And he decides to catch a comet. He goes down to Earth and he has some adventures. And the peak of the story is he sees a whole field of roses. And he says, I thought that one rose I had was so special. But there's whole fields of roses here. And what's so uniquely human is that we can choose to love that one rose. And we can choose to have a transcendent love that even after we break up, you know, and process pain and, you know, have time away in space, we can love that person for the rest of our lives and go beyond the RES flip and the hypergamy and all this crap. And I have a lot of guy friends who I've had business relationships with and we've done really bad stuff to each other. Me failing to lead and some of the things they did act out. And I still remember like, no, this is like my brother and I've chosen to forgive and they probably feel like they had to forgive me, like maybe I did something because they focused on 3%. That's probably like a cop out of an apology. Anyway, I wish I could almost delete that out of this. But the point is like, I guess the best way I could put it is that like, they will see it like I did certain things that like maybe, and I wouldn't say this to them, but like I don't necessarily agree with, but I'm able to recognize that there's a larger structural problem that I had as a leader. And I'm able to recognize that that caused that in them and that I'm the common denominator and experience like that that I've had, okay? So rather that, you, so, so it's almost like in these situations, you know, and, and then I've reestablished friendships with many of them. And so, and, and often done so by even taking the blame for it. And the thing is, is like, in these situations we can get bitter or better. And so I can, use, I can say I have gratitude to you that you adopted my frame, that you gave me that gift of allowing me to, to have leadership. I didn't take us to the promised land. Not exactly happy with how it ended, but thanks for letting me learn. And I can become better so that by the time I'm say a 50 year old, like real leaders, leaders of countries and things like, things like that are often like in their 50s. So you don't have to become this incredible leader by 35. If you can, that's great, maybe faster than I did. Many people can, natural leaders, but you, you can get there. But Every experience that you have of failed leadership, it doesn't mean to take all the blame or to, to shame yourself, but you can still look at your part of it and you can continue to get better. 
And that's where a lot of the loyalty gets inspired. And that's where almost the entire world will become ride or die. And that's, I guess, what I was getting at is like, as far as this hypergamy stuff, I think that to, hypergamy is a thousand times more crazy than you'd understand. Cheating and bad behavior and backstabbing and RES flipping and new identity and blaming and all that is way worse than you'd imagine. It's hard to break out of it. And once that tailspin goes, it's really hard to break out of it. But it's also something where we've got to acknowledge the biology. And at a certain point, men and women have to come back together. But I don't think that we can, like, I don't think you can put like Pandora back in the box or whatever, whatever you call it. Like, I don't feel like we can, I don't feel that we can get there living in a fantasy of like men are perfect, women are perfect or da da da. Because by trying to say that men or women should be perfect, that inherently means a, a hatred of women or a hatred of men. Rather, what I think is that we have, is, is like Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, don't judge the chip in your brother's eye when you have a plank in your own eye. Point that finger back at yourself, not victim shame yourself or be mad at yourself, but look at your leadership and look at what's going on and say to yourself, well, in the same way that like Sam is heading bungalow, Soul House, me running seven, like, there's so many places that you can learn to lead so effortlessly and people will be great. And they really will, and they'll be an asset to you, and women will be an asset to you, and business partners will be an asset to you, and employees will be an asset to you, and boss will be an asset to you, and real synergy can happen. But I feel that to get to the next level, we've got to take these conversations and drive them forward. Otherwise, how are we any different than a complaining, whining, whether partner or whatever, that just loops on the problem and is kind of in that 3%? When have we collectively put ourselves in that 3%, where now you have all women, all men, looping in that 3%, not seeing the larger context, and we're kind of in a tailspin right now. Maybe depopulation agenda, maybe a little bit of Yuri Bezmenov in there, look that up. But how do we break out of it? And I think the way that we break out of it is with truth. And you know, saying like, hey, maybe you have this, maybe men have that. Maybe you're a weak ass bitch leader. Maybe, maybe I feel like you're just going to bounce and RS with me. You know, right? But like saying, okay, so that's part of this. But when has survival been anything less than within the boundaries of that space that we create, right? We have to get food, get shelter, get water. We create resources in which then we could enjoy life. A relationship and love is within these boundaries where the dynamics, buyer-seller dynamic, leadership, attraction, some value asymmetry and so on and so forth, when those things were adhered to, two people can actually connect. But like, like, like an ecosystem that has to be maintained and if the, and if the, the structure of that ecosystem fails, <laughs> like, like the submarine with the rich people that went down and just <laughs> like that, and, the, and, then the, and then that love dies for at least a time, could maybe transition to friendship perhaps later. But it goes <laughs> like that, right? Because you as the man, you create the containing environment upon which there can be a real genuine connection. But because you are asking that other person to go into your frame, to give up options to be with you, you have to provide that leadership. And if you fail, and that's it. So it's far, far worse than you'd imagine that it is. I promise you, it's, great. it's more insane than you'd imagine. But it's also, and it's scary, but it's, and I've seen up close, but it's also better than you could imagine if we tell the truth. I'm not saying I'm perfect truth, but I'm trying if we tell the truth. And that was how, you know, for me, I, I had the, the pain of a lot of different situations in me. And it was via what I, at least what I felt was the truth. I'm, you know, I'm not perfect. It'd be, it'd be cool to have an ongoing discussion about areas that I don't get. But like in my years of decades of studying this, I would just say that, a little self-qualified decades, but that's just how I feel. Um, in studying this, I feel that I've arrived at something pretty damn close to the truth. And so in accepting this, I can truly, truly focus on it. And that's where you find that love. And I'm not gonna be mad at myself for where I fucked up, I just wanna learn from it. I'm not gonna be mad at someone that fucked me over, I wanna learn from it. I, I forgive myself, I forgive them. And it's like it says in the Bible. Gotta love even people who hurt you. Don't judge the chip in your brother's eye when you have a plank in your own eye. Look, we're all spirits here on this earth, together. We're learning from each other. I think it's a beautiful thing. So if you want to learn about this kind of leadership, hop inside here, www.blueprintreloaded.com. And like I've been telling you, the, the lessons that I've learned over many decades are contained within here. I'd love to help take you to the promised land and be a, take a role, like 
allow you to enter into my frame. And I respect the money that you spend. I respect the time and attention that you give. And I respect the fact that you enter into my frame. And like I talked about in this video, I'm not going to let you down. We're going to go together to the end of the fucking rainbow, me and you. I see inside Blueprint Decoded. I love you very much. And I'll talk to you soon. Peace.